celebrated our country's independence this week. And if you were like me at 3 o'clock in the morning still hearing the fireworks going off, anybody like that? Boom! I mean, loudest ever. Loudest ever. You know, we've been celebrating July 4th, and, you know, I'm one of those tightwads. If everybody else in my neighborhood is spending all kinds of money on fireworks, why would I, right? All we have to do is go watch everybody else and enjoy everybody else's uh, fireworks, and that's what we do most every year anyway. But um, we were thinking about July 4th and our independence and our celebration of our freedom. And we think about our national freedom, our independence, but what's more important, I believe, to us as a church is our celebration of our freedom spiritually. You know, the saddest part of our life is not necessarily before we get saved. Sometimes the saddest part of our life is after we give our life to Christ and we get caught in the addictions or the bondage of sin after our salvation because that kills our inner joy and that satisfaction. We feel like we are displeasing to God and it gets us caught in a bondage. And that inner joy, that inner satisfaction, sometimes is wiped away from us because we are not depending on God. We are depending on an addiction or we're depending on ourselves. And whenever we depend on something other than God, it kills that inner joy, that satisfaction. So we have not crucified our flesh, or we haven't given our life over to Christ. We may be saved, we may be going to heaven, but we have issues in our everyday life. Paul is communicating that in Colossians chapter 3. He's communicating to a church. Now he's in prison in Rome, and he is writing a letter to a church, and he's saying, guys, there's important things going on. I know that you're believers I know that you've given your life to Christ, but there's issues within your life. It has to start with your mind, and out of your mind goes into your heart and goes out. There has to be a change. There has to be something within your life that's radical, that's going to change your circumstances. You're in bondage. You have to take off the bondage within your life, and you have to give that life over to Christ. And I know that the majority of us were at church on Sunday morning, July 4th. A lot of people are traveling, but you're here. So I want to communicate to you, like Paul communicated to the church, about how do we celebrate our freedom? How do we give our life to Christ? How can we get rid of the bondage and the chains of the issues of life? And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. Since you have been raised in new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. And I like that first phrase since we're going to talk to the church. Since you have been raised in new life with Christ. Since you have given your life to Christ, I need you to do, remember your identity. Whenever you want to have freedom, you have to remember. You have to go to a point where you remember, I know the, the chains and the bondage. I know the deceptions of Satan. I know I goofed up a lot of different areas in my life. But I have to remember, I am a child of God. I know it. We have to get to a point before we can change our addictions, before we can change our perception, we have to remember, I am a child of God. God does love me. God has forgiven me. Sometimes we get caught in issues of life and we lose perception that I am in Christ. I am a child of God. I have been forgiven. We start thinking from our perception, because I have problems, because things are going wrong, because people in my life cause problems within my life, I get caught in the issue that God must not love me, or I must not be his child. And we have to remember, first and foremost, I am a Christian. We must first focus on who we are in Christ. It all starts at salvation. It all starts at salvation. Last week when we were at junior camp, it was awesome on that Thursday night when we, had, we ended up having 18 people give their life to Christ in that junior camp. It all starts at salvation. But let me tell you, when it starts at salvation, guess what takes place? Satan gets chapped the moment that you get saved. 
he starts getting really upset. And what he tries to do, he tries to cause problems within your life to cause dissatisfaction within your life, within people around you, to cause havoc within your life. And sometimes we just have to sit back and remember, in order for me to be free from my issues, I have to rely on God. And I have to remember, it all starts at salvation. And I have to remember, I am a child of God's. But that doesn't mean problems will not take place. It doesn't mean issues will stop. It means I have an ability to go through my issues. I, have, I shared this with you last week, but I have a really good friend of mine. His name's Lonnie Davis. His wife, Vicki, they just diagnosed her two weeks ago with, uh, with some tumors on the brain, two tumors on the brain. And uh, they're going through all kinds of different issues. We all have family and friends that go through issues. You know, if we did not have Christ while we went through those issues, I don't know how we could handle it. But knowing that I am a child of God, knowing that she is a child of God, it allows us to go through those issues knowing my identity is in Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To know that I can go through junk and know that Christ is going to be with me gives the ability to go through the junk because our focus is on him. Then we know that when I go through stuff, I have people that are going to help me go through, and then I can minister to others when I'm through it. But our first and foremost thing is we have to realize before we can have freedom, we have to have identity. We have to have identity. My first question would be this. Are you identified with Christ? Do you know without a doubt that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And now, without a doubt, I've been identified with Christ. I know without a doubt when I die, I'm going to heaven. Because until we get that part straightened out, we can never be free of issues of life until we know for sure that my identity is in Christ. And once we know that, we can move on. Then the second point is renew your thought life. Renew your thought life. To be free, it all starts in the mind. Listen to what Paul said in verse 2. It says, Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. We have to remember, think about the things of God. What does God want you to do, and how does God work within your life? We have to renew our thought life. If we don't renew our thought life, we're going to be focused on the things of this earth, on what we desire instead of what God desires. We must focus our minds on through above. We must develop internal standards that give God the glory. So how do we do that? On purpose. The Bible says we must take every thought captive. Every thought. Why is thoughts so important? Because in the seed of a thought becomes reality to our minds. The seed of a thought. If I could start thinking about something, if I start dreaming about something, if I start thinking about the things of God, dreaming about the things of God, the things of God becomes a reality to me, and I'm excited about what God can do. But the other side of that, if I start thinking about the sin, or about who I am, or what I've done, what Satan does, he keeps on creeping into our minds, and he starts making us believe that's who we are, instead of identified in Christ, we are the sin. We have goofed up. We can't do any things. He pollutes our minds because of our thought. And we have to take every thought captive. If you've ever had issues, say, say depression. Say, say that you've made mistakes and that, that depression or that conviction or Satan's oppression starts getting to your minds and you start identifying that that's really who I am. I'll never get out of it. I will never be able to beat this addiction or this compulsion. This is who I am. And we start believing because I've made a mistake or because Satan wants me to think, that you, we start thinking that's who I am. And we need to take every thought captive because we are identified with Christ. We have the power through Christ to defeat Satan, defeat our thought process. But until we know we're identified with Christ, we'll never win. Until we take every thought captive, we'll never win. Every thought, 
means when we get up in the morning, we go to bed at night, and what we talk about, what we think about, is so important because the seeds of thought starts multiplying within our minds, within our hearts. We start thinking about things, and that's who we become in our minds. And if anything, sometimes we, we are, are, are worst-case scenarios. We start thinking of what could be, what could happen. And we start thinking about the worst-case scenarios within our life. And what happens, we start living those worst-case scenarios out. Instead of thinking of what Christ can do with us, the best-case scenario, what Christ wants to do through us, we start thinking of what Satan can do with us. And we get depressed, and we get down, and we get out. We get caught in that bondage. But if we take every thought captive, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do certain things, Paul is saying, he said, church, this is important. Until we can take every thought captive, we are going to be in prison. We are going to be in our dirty clothes. We have to change the way we think. We have to change the way that we do certain things. And we have to look at, am I identified with Christ? And is Satan polluting the things I think about? Am I only thinking about the things of this world? Am I only thinking about sin? Am I only doing what I want to do and not doing what Christ wants me to do? The third thing is recognize your old life is dead. Recognize your old life is dead. Now that's a big one. The Bible says, I take glory in the cross. I don't take glory in the things of my past. I have to take glory in the cross. And I have to communicate the things of the cross. But sometimes we as Christians, we revel in our testimony instead of taking delight in God's salvation. What we have to do is we have to say, my past is dead and bury our past. Sometimes we look at our past and we say, I am limited because of my past. Because of my past, I have failed God, so I can't do things for God. And God says just opposite of that. He wants to use our past in order to bring glory to him in our future. But so, if we just take Paul for an illustration, Paul's past was horrendous. He was a persecutor of the Christians. He hated the church. But God chose somebody that had a wicked past to bring glory to his name. What we can do is we can take our past, take our issues, take our family, take the, the things that identified us before we knew Christ, and say, because of my salvation, because of what Christ has done for me, I can look at my past and say, my past is dead. But when we say our past is dead, we have to bury our past. But sometimes we say, I want God to take this part of my past or this part of my past, but we don't give him all of it. We keep what we like about our past. We keep our pet sins. We give God all the negative but yet I want to keep a little bit to myself. Our past has to be buried because what Satan will do, he'll take that little bit that you keep to yourself and he'll water it. It'll blossom. It'll grow. And then we get our identity from our sin instead of our Savior. And if we get our identity from our sin instead of our Savior, Satan allows us to take that into our hearts and our minds And he blows it out of proportion. In verse 3 of chapter 3, it says this. For you died when Christ died. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your real life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual sin, impurity, lust, shameful desires. Don't be greedy for good things of this life, for that is idolatry. God's terrible anger will come upon those who do such things. You used to do them when your life was still a part of this world. You used to do them when your life was part of this world. But when you identified with Christ and you took every thought captive, you have the ability to say, I don't need that stuff anymore. I am going to crucify, I'm going to put to death, I'm going to bury my old life, the things that I desired. We have to be mature enough as Christians to say, I don't want my old life. I want Christ to give me a new life. And when Christ gives us a new life, we can have glory and victory and not bondage. Change doesn't happen 
Sometimes we have to put roadblocks within our life because we desire some of the things that we used to do. And on purpose, on every issue within our life, we must put roadblocks in front of us. Barriers on purpose. Sometimes they're called boundaries, borders. Sometimes we have to say, I know I'm weak in this area. I'm going to bury my past, but knowing what I've done, knowing where I'm weak, I'm going to put boundaries within our life. And sometimes we need people to help us put those boundaries up, recognize my life is dead, but realize your past habits. Realize your past habits. By putting boundaries up, the past habits, we can say, I'm going to work on those things. Now, just because we're a child of God doesn't mean every sin is going to be done away. Doesn't mean every thought will be put in captivity without, our thought, without thinking about it. What we must do is we have to put our past habits in a proper perspective. Knowing where I'm weak, knowing where I fail, and say, I know what my weaknesses are. Your weaknesses may be different than my weaknesses. Your habits may be different than my habits, but we all have weaknesses. So to put a blind eye to it, to say, now that I'm identified in Christ, I will never have those problems, we all know is a lie from Satan. Because just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that you will not have issues within your life. So if we know it's a problem, we must put boundaries within our life. Verses 8 through 11 says this, But now this time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off old evil nature and will be wicked deeds. In its place, you have clothed yourself with a brand new nature that continually being renewed as you learn more and more about Christ who created this new nature within you. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or uncivilized slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. It makes no difference who you are. We must put a focus. It makes no difference what you've done. Put a focus on Christ. Get rid of certain things within your life that's going to cause anger, malice, and maliciousness. Get rid of it. Put it on focus and say, I understand I was one of these things, but Christ gave me a new nature. What's this nature thing? There's two natures within our life, the old nature and the new nature. And when we gave our life to Christ, he put within us the Holy Spirit of God and a new nature. Our old nature is still existence. We still have the old man within us. We still have issues within our life. But we have a ability to conquer the things of this world. And that's the Holy Spirit's power within our life to overshadow. In Galatians chapter 5, it talks about, about the spirit that wars against each other. The, the flesh against the spirit. And they contrary to one another. They fight all the time. And when they fight all the time, we get, we get disillusioned. Basically, who am I going to listen to? Am I listening to the flesh or am I going to listen to the spirit? It's kind of like two angels on your shoulder whispering in your ear. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And in Galatians chapter 5, the flesh is our earthly desires that we have become accustomed to. The spirit is the new nature that God has given to us when we give our life to Christ. And once we've given our life to Christ, the Holy Spirit within our life gives us abilities to fight our past. And we have to crucify those things. We have to, on purpose, crucify those things. When I'm, when I'm talking to people all the, all the time in the office and doing counseling, they, they, they come across, they, well, it just happened. Things just happened. Well, I just did this. No, can I say things don't just happen. Things may happen. But if we took every thought captive and we put our life in God's perspective and understand everything has consequences, whatever I do has consequences, we can put our sin under the blood, bury our life, and things won't just happen because we're taking a proactive approach of sin. Now, things might happen physically. They might happen relationally. But things usually don't just happen. And what we have to do is we have to take every thought captive and put Christ where he needs to be. But lastly, it says, replace them with new ones. 
Replace them with new ones. In verse 12 it says, Since God chose you to be a holy people, whom he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercies, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And the most important piece of clothing you must wear is love. Love is what binds us all together in perfect harmony. The evidence of our salvation is the fruit of the Spirit. And in that, humility, gentleness, and patience. And you must allow for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Once we have been forgiven, we have the ability to forgive others. It's very difficult. There's issues that are overwhelming to us. And I, I, I share this illustration. And if you've been here for some time, I, w- I want to preface this. You, you may have heard all my stories. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of people in the church that haven't heard all my stories. And uh, for you that know me, I, I am your pastor. And you know my stories and you know know me because I've been here for 13 years. But some of the, the new people that have come into our church, they don't know what makes me tick or what has took me through the journey to where I am and what makes, what motivates me. And when we talk about forgiveness, there, there's an issue that took place in, in my family's life uh, when I was in high school that radically changed the direction of my life and the focus of my future. And my brother was, was, was put in prison because of it. He raped a, a girl that was in my high school. And he was put in prison over in Hutchinson. And he was in, he's been in prison for uh, about 30 years off and on. He just got out a few years ago, or a few weeks ago. But um, I was asked to speak at one of the pastors' meeting, national pastors' meeting for the Baptist Bible Fellowship. And they gave me the topic of forgiveness. They gave me the topic of forgiveness, and I sat in my office right over there, and I was trying to prepare the sermon on forgiveness. And uh, the Spirit just would, it, it just didn't click. Have you ever, you wanted to do it, you, you had the information. I could give you all the scriptures about forgiveness. I could tell you what God's forgiveness is. I had all the intellectual information on forgiveness, and I could give out an intellectual plan on how God forgives me and how I should forgive others. And I was writing all that stuff down, and nothing was clicking. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit kicked me right in the face. And he said this, Who have you not forgiven? And I thought, I love everybody. I don't have any problem with anybody. Everybody loves me. I don't have any problems. And he sat there and he brought back to my remembrance my brother. And how for years I hated him. Not just didn't like him. I hated him. I thought he caused my life a living hell growing up. And I did not realize how much I hated him. Until that moment... God broke me and he talked to me about forgiveness and he said you know you can preach all you want to preach but until you experience what you're preaching about it's not going to make an impact in people's lives so I had my secretary call the chaplain at the, at the prison and for the very first time in my life I walked through the doors of prison and the door shut behind me it was the scariest feeling of the world and I sat in a little room with my brother for the first time since I was 16 years of age and I just started talking to him and um, the topic of me being a preacher came up he said I hear you're a preacher yeah preacher yes that's kind of funny that you're a preacher yeah it's kind of funny Um, but I said Ronnie I said I'm here for a purpose And I told him the story about preaching at this meeting. And I said, they gave me the topic of forgiveness. And I said, I have to forgive you. 
and I want to ask you to forgive me for having that animosity towards you. And it was an awkward, very awkward time. But we got to talk, and we, he forgave me, and I forgave him. It was, it was a very awkward, awkward time. But the lesson of that 45-minute visit changed the way that I can perceive what I preach about. Because it can't be information. It can't be what the Bible says. It has to be applying what the Bible says. I've taken that point. It happened many years ago. I've taken that point, and I've changed the way that I perceive what I communicate about and how I live. Forgiveness. We have to accept other people's faults and forgive them because you have faults. And we have to remember that God forgave you, and if God loves you, you need to love others. And if we don't have the ability to forgive others and accept people of their faults, what we will do is we become arrogant and self-righteous, and the love of God is not real within our life. The church, over a period of time, some, some churches have become self-righteous, thinking that we are better because we have Christ. And we're not better. We're just saved. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, we have to look at people and look at their faults and love them and understand if it wasn't for the grace of God, you would be in the same position. But if we apply Colossians chapter 3 and put our identity in Christ and say, it is all about Christ. I'm saved because of Christ. We know that. I could put a date and a time and an issue that I know that Jesus changed my life and he came into my life. I can know without a doubt that my identity is in Christ. My salvation is secure. My inheritance is forever. And then put every thought in his command. Every morning and every night, the things that I say, the things that I think about, I need to take every thought and make it captive. And understand, recognize my past is dead. And bury my past. Bury it. We have to bury our past. Many of us, the past that we have, goof-ups that we have made, issues that have taken place within our life, have paralyzed us from doing what God wants us to do in the future. We think, we believe, what we did defines who we are. And if we are defined by our past, what Jesus did on the cross is no effect. Because what we did in our past is natural. We are sinners are supposed to sin. It is natural that sinners sin. But it's natural for believers to put our faith in Christ is to bury that sin and not be defined by that bit sin, but be defined on who Christ is. So look at our past, bury our past, and move on from our past. But in doing that, we have to put boundaries of where our weaknesses are. This is just maturity. Put boundaries. Know that I, if I walk too close to that edge, it's easy for me to fall off that edge. I need to take a couple steps away from that edge, knowing I will not fail and fall. Failing is not final. I can sin and not fail Christ. But what fails Christ is if I don't get up from that sin and stay in that sin. We must put our boundaries on. And then we must replace them with new habits. We must replace them with new habits. How do we do that? Satan wants us to become disillusioned at best. He wants us to think that the first thing that we need to give up is our faith. That we don't need to put focus on our faith. And what happens if we do not put focus on our faith, we become bound to our life, to ourself. But when we put focus on our faith and say it is real and I'm going to put habits in place that's going to mature me, that's going to grow me, that I don't put my faith on coast mode. But when we put our faith on coast mode, we will wake up two years, three years, or five years down the road, and we'll find ourselves falling away from God. And we'll look back and we'll say, man, I want to be there. At one time in my life, I strive for this. I desired to be a follower after Christ. I desired to do what God wants me to do. But if there was a certain time, or there was a certain situation, or there was a failing in my life, 
Well, I just said no to the things of God, and I walked away. I walked away for what he wanted me to do. And we become habitual in our lifestyle. And there's a time where we have to say no to the habitual habits of this life and say yes to new and fresh life in Christ. It may mean we have to make some changes. It may mean that we have to bury some old things. It may be difficult. We may have to change our friends. We may have to learn a new language, a new vocabulary. We may have to bite our lip a few times. We may have to throw our computers out the window. We may have to do certain things that's going to be difficult. But if we're going to have habits glorifying to Christ, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us our self-will and give our will to Christ's love. We need to put our life in boundaries. So in our freedom this week, it's easy to celebrate our national freedom, our Independence Day. And we all live in a, in a country that's free and we can worship God. But not all of us live in a life that's free. There are many people that live in a life of bondage, a jail cell. A jail cell that you have the key to open up yourself. But sometimes we do not open the door to our freedom. We enjoy where we are. We may not know that we enjoy it. We may think, I want out. But we have the ability to open up our own cell and be free because of what Christ has done for us. The first thing in order to have freedom is to know Christ. If we do not know Christ, you do not have freedom. But if you do have Christ, you have the ability through Christ to open up a new way of thinking, a new life in him, to enjoy inner joy, inner peace. The Bible says, clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercies, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You must make allowances for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive them. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive them. And I would add to that, you must forgive yourself. You have to forgive yourself. You have to bury your past, open the door to your future, and see what God can and will do. That's our celebration for this upcoming year. A new independence. We're talking about a healthy church. For the next six weeks until September, we get the privilege of talking about what God can do through the body of Christ. And we've shared over the last six weeks but I believe when you're talking about a healthy church, I believe it all starts with this issue of maturity. And is the church, not the building, but is the church, the people, mature enough that they can look at the word of God and say, I need to make changes. I can forgive others, and I know they have faults. I can't look at them and judge my life because of them. I have to look at my life in the light of God's love. I have to forgive myself as Christ forgave me, and I have to put into place things, habits, that's going to make me grow. I want to give you three habits in closing. I need you to write these down. These are very important. Until we make these habits, we will never grow maturity in the church and in my own life. Number one, we need to make a habit of talking to God. If he loves you enough to send his son to die for you, and he forgave you and our identities in Christ, we should thank him. We, should, we shouldn't have a problem with praying, just talking to God, thanking him for what he's done. On a daily basis, habitual practice of praying. Second habitual practice of reading, reading a portion of a scripture, finding something to, to pray about, to focus on, to read, to study, to equip. Praying to God and reading his word will give us a new 
energy and a new focus and a vitality to do what God wants us to do. So three simple habitual practices. Praying, reading, and then loving, accepting. Looking for someone to invest your life in. Looking to somebody to minister to, to pray with. If you're praying to God and you're reading his scriptures and you ask God, Lord, give me the ability to invest in someone's life, to pray with them, to walk beside them, and to help them. You know what that does to you? That gives you a focus that it's not about you. It's praying to God. It's reading God's word. It's being a vehicle, a messenger, a missionary into God's word through his work to do his will. So if I'm praying to God and reading God's word and I'm living my life, serving somebody else, guess what that does for me? It gets my eyes off of my past and my failures and my insecurities and puts my focus on God. My identity is in Christ. Then I can understand how God loves me because God is using me. But if we are never used by God because we're not a tool that God can use, then we start believing Satan's lies because we're not being used. We don't have a purpose. We feel like we're ineffective. But if I'm praying to God, if I'm reading his word, and I'm being used by God, that gives me an inner joy. That gives me significance. It gives me purpose because God is using me. It's just being a pastor. Pastoring people. Loving people. Serving people. Start with God. And let God use you to be a conduit to serve others. That gives you freedom. It gives you a purpose. It gives you significance. Then we can have peace. Then we can get rid of our bondages of sin and purpose. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for your freedom that you've given to us. But Lord, I pray that we will apply it. Not just know you, but to love you. To have a purpose within our life. To let you be so genuinely real that we don't just talk about you, we live for you. Give to us a desire to be free. To live a life of purpose, of satisfaction, and significance. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.